spoiler. The spoiler would be evil and mean. That would, no, just, it's worth reading. We're good? We can go ahead and I can start yammering on? Okay, wonderful. Um, welcome to my presentation. Um, I got accused at one point by a coworker of um, living in the future and dealing with all these sort of bugs that he never has to see and never has to deal with. And I said, hey, that sounds like a good talk title. Um, as pointed out by another individual, this is basically what I do. I talk about technology and how it works. And I am willing to put myself in the spot where it's broken and figure out what we do at that point. So that's my business card. My name's Jeff. I build infrastructure for a living now, I think. Um, they call me an infrastructure designer. They don't know what that means, and I don't either. So I try and figure out how infrastructure works. And I sat there one day really realizing that I was deeply di diverging in my utilization of this technology from anything my users did. I live in an SSH terminal. I use a web browser. I hit things with Perl or Haskell when the day's going well. Um, my users are trying to interact with mailing lists using their cell phones. I don't know what this is. I don't know how to build technology to support that. So I set out one day to say, I should figure out what this stuff is that people are using and what this new spangled stuff is and how it works. So I went down the path of saying, OK, let's hack a chunk of my personal budget out, find the dollars, and then when something new and crazy shows up, have them available to say, let's see what that's going to do. What this means is that I basically live in an unpolished universe where everything's broken all the time, but it has occasional moments of awesome. This is the consumer electronics story of me going, hey, this is really, oh, repeatedly. Um, again, I'm an infrastructure engineer. I build networks for a living. This is not about networking. So let's talk about the easy one. How many people in the room are presently wearing a pebble? OK, I got two. That's pretty good. Uh, uh, how many people own a pebble? OK, there's more. <laughs> this is pretty typical. Uh, pebble is a smartwatch. Um, what that means is that it's a watch that doesn't know what time it is unless it's connected to your cell phone. Turns out mine drifts about a minute per day when not connected to my cell phone. Good start, but OK. Leave it connected to the cell phone. What does it do for you? Well, it can put SMS messages on your wrist. OK, that's cool. That means I don't have to go digging for my cell phone every time it bleeps at me, which is, I just realized I haven't silenced it. So it's probably going to go off at some point in this talk. Sorry. Um, yeah, OK. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> um, and yes, a uh, message just showed up here. Clear it. OK, great. Um, this thing also can be a remote control because it can load arbitrary applications. This means that somebody has to go write an arbitrary application. OK, what does it have for interfaces and sensor? We're staring at, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your effort on making my cell phone go off in the middle of the talk. That seems like a good idea to blame Timmins in general. Um, so the fun part with this is it's an interface that's on your wrist, and it's always on your wrist. One of the most useful things I've found is that it can act as the audio remote control. So you can have play, next track, previous track, pause. I ride the bus to work. My phone is stuffed in my pocket, and I am surrounded by 60 to 100 students on the bus while I am doing this. Fishing out my cell phone involves elbowing two of them to accomplish that mission. On the other hand, hanging onto the bar, reaching up, and going, pause. What are we crashing into now is a lot easier. Um, this leads to another point. I can run this blind. I don't have to look at it because it's a set of sequences that you get to hit 
sequentially, manually, it works the same way every time. The music control is hit the center button until it pauses or plays. You now are on the music control, skip tracks forward, backwards. I haven't looked at it. This is great. This is wonderful. Only one sort of problem with that. You get to choose exactly one music application. Who here uses more than one music application? Oh, uh, yeah, me too. Um, Pandora, I use. Google Play Music. The Netflix controls actually work. I'm not sure why I want to fly Netflix on my phone from my Pebble. Next track does... We'll be getting to that in a moment. <laughs> um, and for the record, yes, I am perfectly happy answering questions in line. I will be charging through a whole bunch of different technology and answering questions while we are in the middle of this. I have turned the mic around, and we will hopefully pick up more of the atmospheric. Um, I'm perfectly happy answering questions in line as I go. This is actually better, because if you save them all to the end, we'll be talking about stuff that we haven't thought about in 20 minutes. OK. So the only thing that happens to work with the Netflix is pause play, because next track and previous track don't make any sense, and it doesn't have that interface. But OK, great. That's actually pretty cool. Next thing on the list, as was being alluded to. Who here knows what a Chromecast is? Everybody knows what a Chromecast is. Who here is, actually has one and uses it? OK, nearly everyone. These things are really entertaining. Plug them into the side of your computer screen, or in my case, the television. I hear they make good televisions. I haven't actually used it as a television in quite a while. Clearly a mistake on my part. When you plug it into the television, it shows up as an HDMI device, connects to your network, and allows you to stream media to it from various sources. It works in at least three different ways. Different way number one, it actually can, in fact, stream whatever's on your laptop screen to the screen. That means that your laptop has to be beefy enough to encode whatever video is on your screen and stream it to your screen. And you have to have enough internet bandwidth in your, excuse me, Wi-Fi bandwidth to make that work. This is a problem. Most 802.11g, which is what is in most people's homes, does not have enough bandwidth to make the streaming work. Okay, but you know, I run a home network, it's elaborate, it's complicated, it's running three parallel networks stacked on top of each other. Never, ever, ever tear down your production network so that you can play with something crazy. Always build new before destroying your existing production. Because if you destroy your existing production, you will find yourself sitting there looking at the new thing going, this should work and I have no mechanism of looking up any documentation whatsoever to figure out why it hasn't and my cell phone's broken now because that was part of the new crazy. So I can't even use my cell phone to go look it up online. Um, I spent a solid two hours, the first night I got my Chromecast, experimentally black box determining how it does all of this. Answer, multicast packets, not broadcast, multicast packets across wireless, which means all of the really cheap access points work fine because they don't understand what's going on and just broadcast the frame around. On the other hand, the very nice Cisco access point I was running on looked at the IGMP and started trying to do IGMP snooping, trying to figure out what to do with this packet. And it all just sat, sat there going, something's broke. Something's broke. Something's broke. Great. Diagnostics any? Nope, nothing. Very pretty art on the screen. Anyway, so most of the people are seen this already. Uh, when you fire up Chromecast, uh, connected applications end up with the little icon next to the search button. That icon, push it, and then it'll list every Chromecast it can see on the local layer two, uh, local layer two network, and you push one, and magically it works. This means that you should not allow your friends who are marginally evil to annoying access to your layer two network because that means that they get to push arbitrary things to all of your screens and will. This has been described for nothing. as one of my friends pointed out. Um, this 
means that arbitrary Google has been this has been mentioned to Google repeatedly and they say well that's a social problem uh, yeah well yes yeah, some of my friends do have social problems but we're not talking about that um, we're talking about the actual serious problem of how do you do control on this and basically it has not but you accept that and move forward so one of the neat tricks at this point though is when you're sitting there casting all of a sudden your phone doesn't work right anymore. Now, this is a screenshot actually from my cell phone. Um, you start hitting the volume button. What the heck is that? You're actually driving the volume on the Chromecast device. You aren't driving the volume on your phone or on your ringer. And, I, and it just contextually guesses which volume you are trying to set. This drifts around. So if you're playing the audio right now, it's the Chromecast audio. But if you're looking through stuff on your phone, it's your phone audio. Because it turns out you can, in fact, play stuff on your phone while play stuff through Chromecast at the same time. But now you have to figure out which one of those command and control buttons is doing its job. But most of the time, this works great. It's wonderful most of the time. And, you know, it does this nice art thing on my television and shows album cover art, playback. That's all great. And then there was one day I was at home playing something through my Chromecast. And I was in the kitchen. Cell phone is laying somewhere out in the room. It's playing audio to the Chromecast, and my phone rings. Chromecast stops playing back. My phone is ringing. And Pebble is vibrating on my arm, letting me know that an incoming phone notification has happened. So at this point, I have to take a divergent path to explain that this is going to get a little weird. When setting up this particular talk, I was trying to figure out what sequence to talk about technology in. And I, I'm trying to figure out, how do I come up with a um, non-acyclic -ac directed graph of all of this technology so that we stand a chance of going through it in some linear order. And about 10 minutes into figuring this out, I said, there isn't one. This stuff loops on itself. All of this interacts with each other and comes back. So I now have to jump forward in the talk for a moment, and we'll get back to that. So here I am sitting here with my phone ringing in the other room, pebble on my arm vibrating, informing me that there's an incoming phone call. The television paused, and I say, well, what happens if I answer it? I push the answer button. Then Google Glass in the other room picks up the phone call. <laughs> we'll be getting back to that. Uh, but in a very much less crazy moment was I'm standing there and I say, I don't like this track that I'm playing. And without thinking about it, this is actually the second time this happened, I reach down and I hit next track. And all of a sudden, my television changes what track is playing. Yes. Pebble is talking to Google Play Music. Google Play Music is talking to Chromecast. Pluggable architectures work. All of a sudden, I was living in the future for a moment. This is cool. I'm standing three rooms away, and I can run the music in my living room. That's about the best story that comes out of that. Yes? I've been able to synchronize audio um, between Chromecast or do more than one cast at once. No. <laughs> So the question, just to make sure it got on there, is it possible, or have I been able to synchronize audio between multiple Chromecasts? To this state, no. However, see the um, directed acyclic graph that I don't have? I was able to do that on a different piece of technology that I'm getting to. So, charging right along. Um, best feature ever of the Chromecast, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, it's a media playback machine. Yeah, it'll play Netflix. Yeah, it'll do Google Play Music. Yeah, there's an open API. This fixed my art problem in my living room. <laughs> my living room now has art on it whenever my TV's up and running because the idle screen is this incredible series of carefully curated photos that rotate every few minutes. This is shockingly, I think, the most useful thing I've gotten out of Chromecast. And the best part is, it's actually a web page. Um, I'm not going to go load it, but it's just a web page that's being loaded. So you can grab that web page and toss it up in any web browser and it works. 
Uh, yeah, the screensaver is an idea that a lot of people have had for doing exactly that. Okay, so flip through this. I think I got that stuff. So I was talking about Chromecast and living in the future moment of it where running controls from Pebble runs my television. All of this is, of course, possible because everything's being interfaced on your cell phone. And these cell phones are getting carried away crazy. This is not an unusual cell phone in any way, shape, or form. It's a Nexus 5 that I just throw money at whatever the latest Nexus device is and say, OK, and let's see what happens from there. Most people look at cell phones and go, hey, look at that bright new display. Or it has more numbers of some variant of some form indicating it goes faster, we think. I like exploring all of the hardware features set on these phones, and one of the things that's shown up, uh, this has gone on most Android cell phones today, and I don't know, it's been there, what, three years? NFC. How many people use the NFC functionality on their phone in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm going to get to that in a moment. Yes, it does, in fact, freak out nearly every sales attendant when we're using Google Wallet. But NFC is actually more generic than that. NFC is a 13 megahertz inner uh, connect, which allows you to do low speed, which is to say hundreds of kilobits per second data between two devices sitting roughly next to each other. Um, the devices can both be active, so you can you know put phones next to each other and push the button to beam, and it flows data back and forth. Or you can have passive devices. I have a pile of NFC tags with me. If you want to play with them at some point, come find me afterwards. This is actually my diagnostic set because it turns out there's at least four standards for NFC tags, and the hardware on your phone is dependent on which ones it can and cannot read, which means that I then have to carry multiple cell phones around for the different interfering hardware standards. Okay, um, but the thing that most people end up playing with NFC if they're doing anything is this wonderful thing called Google Wallet. Google Wallet is an NFC payment system where basically you rig it such that your credit card and something that looks sort of like PayPal and works sort of like PayPal, run by Google, can do NFC-based payment with readers that know how to speak it. So first I got to find readers that know how to speak it. That's a challenge to start with. There was a website and I found half a dozen places in my local area that claim to have NFC support for doing, uh, I think it's called MasterCard PayPass is the exact thing. And the icon you're looking for is this icon on the right, which is the wavy symbol thing. If you ever see that sitting on the payment terminal in front of you, it might work. Um, so first, annoyance. To make any of this work, you have to have on online data transactions. In my case, let's talk about my favorite coffee shop. I wander into my favorite coffee shop. It associates to the coffee shop's Wi-Fi. Once it's associated with Coffee Shop's Wi-Fi, they throw up a page which says, I have to agree to these terms of service that nearly nobody ever reads. At which point I go to pay, and there's no data path to Google, and it's all broken. Because I haven't accepted the page yet. So every single place I walk into now, it's sort of like, I, oh crap, I'm going to have to pay with this. Figure out how to get through the authentication page so that I can get an online transaction so I can add Google Wallet so it'll run. Always on data connectivity as a requirement basically could happen, but rarely ever does. And that makes me sad. Um, but even after that, got the Google Wallet open, got it unlocked, the NFC thing's ready to go, go put it up next to a reader and go bleep, at which point every sales staff ever goes, what just happened? They have no idea that their readers were even capable of this. And they look down at the cash register and goes, bing, drawer pops out and they go, what? <laughs> I have a problem with the future. Which is, ex as Mucho Mas pointed out, I'm from the future is literally the line I say to them, at which point that confuses them more. And it's wonderfully fun. They get paid, I leave a $2 bill as a tip, everybody's happy. Um, the problem is, of all of the places that claim to have support for this, 
I have about a 40% success rate of it actually working. The failure modes are pretty hilarious. Failure mode one, bleeding, runs, sits there, sits there. Five minutes later, get a sales associate. I'm standing across the counter from me. What did you do to it? Sorry, cancel the transaction and go find a piece of plastic and swipe it. Okay, uh, Meyer actually works. Uh, Home Depot, blip, crashes. You need to reset this thing, walk to a different out, <laughs> go use a different counter. Um, good news is they actually know what I did there because they'd seen it enough times. They can't fix it, but they know what I did. Um, and while I'm still on this slide, uh, this is hard to see, but this is a brand new point of sale terminal. It has a swipe on the right side, it has NFC up at the top, and it has chip and pin reader down on the bottom. Coworker of mine has a lot of fun trying to use his chip and pin card that he got specifically for his Europe trip. And he and they never work, but the ways that they fail are pretty hilarious. In this reader, he puts the chip and pin in and it just ignores him. He has another one, he tried to get me a photo but didn't have time to uh, get there. Puts the chip and pin reader in, plugs it in, and it goes, please swipe card. <laughs> Yay. Okay, but this next one's pretty good. So I'm going to a vending machine. Now, Google Wallet, the way it actually is working is what it does is generates a virtual debit MasterCard, which is the transaction point, which the vendor gets to see. I walked up to this thing, I saw the symbol, I said, ah, got to try this. Blip, and I don't know if you can read it, MasterCard debit card's not allowed, please try a different card. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Uh, point of order. Yes. I work for uh, a bank that issues MasterCards. <laughs> point Please of order. I, uh, I work for a bank that issues MasterCards with PayWave mm -hmm. or the PayPass, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, on campus, they don't work. And you get exactly that same error. <laughs> <laughs> it's glorious. Oh, good. It's not just me. Nope. <laughs> Even when it's supposed to work, in the place that is optimized to possibly work, it still doesn't work. Um, so it turns out there is another service that does this. I am I believe it's called ISIS. I tried to use it. Said service requires a different app per cell phone vendor. Excuse me, cell phone carrier, not cell phone vendor. There are three different apps listed. And as I bought a Nexus phone from Google Play, definitionally I'm not carrier locked and none of the apps work with my phone. So I don't know how that works, but maybe it works better, I hope. As a side note, I've been wandering around with slabs of cell phone now for several years and it drives me up the wall that I can't actually run them without staring at them. As you might have noted earlier in the conversation, I said, Pebble, best part ever, I can run it blind. Why? Tactile feedback buttons that I can find without having to look at them. That's actually reasonably important, and it's really hard to get on a modern cell phone. Uh, you can do silly stuff like, ah, here's a Bluetooth keyboard that I can carry around next to my cell phone. I can get cases that wrap my cell phone in another keyboard and it's sort of like, seriously? Uh, in the bag I have laying around here somewhere, uh, I'm not going to pull it out. I actually still carry around a Evo Shift specifically so I can shove the keyboard out, bind it to my modern phone so that I can have an interface that has a hard key on it. Was there a question in the back? Wondering what you think of the Twiddler keyboard. You hold it in one hand and it has buttons and you use it like that. I am aware of it. I have not sat down to try to figure out how to get it useful for me. I have not bought it. I am considering it, but not quite there yet. Don't no data. I apologize. I believe in the hard keyboard for the sole reason that sitting there 
punching a piece of glass with your finger is probably the least feedback you can ever get on interacting with a chunk of hardware. So I actually tried walking around using nothing more than an Android tablet for about a year and a half. No hard keyboard with me at all. I gave up. And then I put that thing in its uh, folding case tablet, uh, tablet case with keyboard in it, at which point I realized I had the exact same size and form factor as a laptop. So why am I not carrying a laptop? Because the tablet was supposed to be smaller, but once you put the keyboard on it, it's not. And I said, well, let's try something else. So I bought a Chromebook. And now this meta discussion happens. This entire presentation was, in fact, written on a Chromebook. The entire presentation was pulled together using Chromebook functionality. It is presently being presented by a Chromebook. I do believe this is the only Linux box that I've never had to wrestle with to get to work with a projector. That's unusual. Um, the interface is good enough. It gives you most of the functionality you need. They do not have to be online all the time. If my internet connection drops out, my presentation does continue to function. It's a very wonderful thing. It's called caching. It's this newfangled idea. Um, it has one of the best keyboards I've found on a modern laptop, which is weird. It also has some of the best audio I've ever found on a laptop, which was even stranger. But most importantly, it had this absolutely ridiculously high DPI display. 2,600 pixels wide in a 13-inch display. I can no longer see the pixels. This is awesome. Clean, clear, rendered fonts. They pull down the large version of the image and render it all scaled appropriately. No problem. No software in the world knows how to handle a high DPI display. Nothing. In fact, the way it runs is it has a 2600 pixel wide display and that it advertises up through the web browser and through the rest of the interface is a 1280 pixel wide display. So all of the web pages render right. Because I have no reasonable way of showing this on the screen, but if you would like to come up and take a look at the laptop, I'll run it all the way up where it claims its full resolution. And web pages break. Stuff where they're expecting a flow to hit on the side of the thing, flows left, flows right, and there's this tiny column of text down the center of the page and the buttons don't work. This happens all over the place. So you actually have to advertise out that you have a display which is small. And then all we get to do with it is render very nice looking fonts. Okay. This is a problem. It's sad. Someday we'll do better than this, I hope. Okay. So now we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to go talk about stuff that I really don't care about how high pixel density it is because it's my living room and it's across the room. Um, who here has actually heard of the Nexus Q? Who here has actually played with one? No. But I, I like where you're going with that. Google I.O. 2012, they released three chunks of hardware. Um, one of them was the Nexus Q. They thought about it a bit and then said, we're not doing that anymore. So they sent out a bunch of them for free, and they keep on showing up on eBay. I started collecting them about a year ago as an entertaining platform to play with. Uh, my eBay sniper got a little carried away and picked off four of them, so I've been playing with them. At the time, all of the software infrastructure was up and running from Google's side to make this work. Now back to, your, uh, back to the question about getting synchronous. The Nexus Q is basically equivalent hardware to a Galaxy Nexus cell phone without the display. You plug it into an HDMI port and plug it into your television. It also comes with a 25 watt analog audio out amplifier so it can directly drive speakers. It also has SPDIF out which means that you can plug it into a audio console of some sort. I assume audio amplification or something like that. It can put all of these in sub-millisecond sync with each other. It had a software stack where what you would do is it would sit there and play ticks out of all of the speakers together and pull them all into phase synchronization. At which point you could turn all of them on, play the audio together, 
and it was all in dead sync. That's cool, that, but that's one device. That's all of the outputs out of one device. Two Nexus queues on the same L2 would put in themselves into sync with each other, at which point you could play audio through all three outputs on every Nexus queue in your entire house, or later two networks, to be honest, and they would all be synchronized. No longer would you ever sit there playing the same stream in two different rooms separated by 40 milliseconds, which is really annoying. These are entertaining devices. Now, all of the hardware, or excuse me, all of the back-end software support to support the Nexus Q stack went away when Chromecast came out. Well, what do I do with them now? So, CyanogenMod, a gentleman decided, hey, we should port to that because it's an OMAP 4460, which they were somewhat familiar with already, and ported CyanogenMod 10.1 to it. The gentleman who ported it did so blindly, according to the documentation, as in he doesn't own one. He figured out how to bring the entire system up without actually ever owning the hardware involved. That's pretty awesome in my book. Um, this is Cyanogen. Uh, there's no touch screen there. It is, of course, my television, which means that I have to figure out how to fly it. Cyanogen knows how to speak USB host, so you plug into it with a on-the-go cable. You have USB port, you plug the keyboard and mouse into it, and you can fly the keyboard and mouse. Awesome. Great. Now I want to actually load something onto it, and I need access to Android Debug. Which means I unplug the USB on the go cable, I plug in the USB cable, plug it into my Android development platform, and connect to it via ADB, and it sits there and goes, puts up on the screen, hey, there's this host with this RSA key. Do I allow it to connect? And I look at that on the screen, and I go, my keyboard and mouse are disconnected. How exactly am I going to click OK? So I unplug that, at which point the prompt goes away. <laughs> right then, this is going to be more complicated. Answer, get a Bluetooth mouse and keyboard. Use the USB keyboard and mouse to associate the Bluetooth keyboard and mouse. Bring the Bluetooth keyboard and mouse up. Disconnect the USB cable, plug in the actual, uh, uh, disconnect USB on the go, plug in actual USB, bring up the Android debug bridge. Connect to it via that way, and then use the Bluetooth keyboard and mouse to actually click the accept button and say the, and remember this forever. I have to do this dance every time I blow away the software stack on it as I'm working on the software stack, because each time it clears all of the associations. Which, I'll, I'll point out, I brought this with me. This is actually the Bluetooth mouse and keyboard I utilize at home. It's a cute little form factor. It's amazing what you can find on Amazon. Nearly every Chinese importer of electronics decides to post them on Amazon, so search terms are awesome. On the back of it, they put a universal IR remote, which is even better, because now I can sit there and run my television on one side and flip it over and run the Nexus Q on the other. For reasons I haven't quite figured out, they put a laser pointer on it. <laughs> lasers are awesome. I have no idea why there's a laser pointer on it. Uh, apparently, and by the way, the power switch on the side turns off the Bluetooth, but not the laser pointer. Um, amusingly, this actually charges via USB, at which point you plug it into the USB on the go cable, because why not at that point? Um, 20 bucks. I have gay Chinese importers. $20 for this? Okay, that works for me. So, back to the Nexus Q's interface. Finally got it. I can run it from across the room. It really does believe it's an Android tablet. I, ooh, that's terribly out of focus. My apologies. Uh, that's default Cyanogen set. Uh, XBMC is there. This is useful. You can run Xbox Media Center on this setup. It works great. Talks to the rest of the universe. Um, there are some issues. So it has the media player. This is Apollo. Came with CM101. It's a actually reasonably nice media player for something that has no cloud access at all. The problem then becomes this. I pull this up, tap one of these to load it, and then I get this. It is, the Nexus Q is not an Android tablet. I can't pick the television up and just go <laughs> That doesn't work. Um, there's a lot of things like this inside of Android. Android started out as most everybody knows, as a cell phone platform. And then people started putting it on tablets. 
And then Honeycomb happened. Because they looked at Android 2.4 on a tablet and goes, that's pretty horrible, actually. Let's do something about that. And then Android 3 and 3.1 happened, which made the tablet interface useful. Great. Wonderful. That's integrated everywhere now. It's a wonderful set. It can handle tablets. How do you do in place to Android? How do you do Android on a platform that isn't actually associated with the person? Um, there's an interesting aside here, and I'm going to go down it because I have a few minutes. Changing to cell phones altered how we utilized phone systems. Prior to cell phones, we called places. We had the concept of the home phone and office phone. Cell phones became a moment where you call people. And their physical position doesn't matter anymore. And it's a very subtle difference, but it actually makes a huge difference in how you use the technology. No longer am I going to chase through trying to figure out how to get a hold of somebody by calling four different numbers to hit four different physical locations. You call one number and the physical location doesn't matter anymore. This is sort of the opposite case of that. How do you take Android from something that was designed to be as actually associated with a single individual and turn it into something that makes sense sitting in a living room where there are multiple people who might be interacting with it? The platform changes and the way you use it changes. So the interface has to change to go with that. And just to make the point, no, really, I didn't have any of the auto-rotate on. That's all turned off. And in no way, shape, or form have I authorized any of the applications to rotate the screen. There's just applications that don't know how to work in the landscape form. And then they go, I'll go portrait, and you'll move the tablet so it'll work. Nope. Uh, funniest method ever for dealing with that. So I'm sitting there on the touchpad, and then it goes sideways. And I'm trying to figure out how to fly the touchpad. And if you've ever flown a touchpad 90 degrees out of alignment with the screen you're looking at, it's really unpleasant. Well, I can't change the screen, but I can change the touchpad. <laughs> Twist the touchpad, and all of a sudden everything lines up. And so, well, OK. Um, so I've been playing with Nexus Qs. I have a lot of them. Uh, I have enough of them that I can sit there and mess with the hardware platform and figure out all the fun stuff buried underneath of it. What is in this thing? Well, this means that I have eBay set up to run, and, you know, I'll catch and bid on stuff. And then occasionally you bid on something, and you end up with something that has that on the bottom of it. Things showed up. Hmm. I'm still working on this. I don't have a lot of uh, information on it beyond the fact that, unlike the ones that ship to production, this one shipped with user debug, and I can ask it to reload uh, Android as root. And thus I can scrape the entire memory blocks off of it. It didn't wipe. That's cool. What else is in this thing? Uh, it also has different external physical characteristics, less plastic, more metal. And uh, these are two and a half pounds of cast metal. This is how they have the, this is how they run the 25 watt audio amplifier. It's just a massive heat sink. No fans. So at this point, I'm sitting there, and I've been doing this for a while, and I'm managing blobs upon blobs upon blobs of data because I have to track all of these firmware images, which are blobs. I have no idea what's in them, but I have to hang on to them. So I've been adopting a large series of tools. These are my two favorite ones, and I let everybody know about them because they've made my life better. Git Annex, which is what that symbol is, is a large object tracker integrated into the Git's code or revision control system. This means that I can track software and this uh, large binary objects that it's designed to interact with in a single tree. The large binary objects are never stored in the revision history, but I store links to them, and this is how I migrate data back and forth. The other one which I strongly suggest for anything where I actually care what the bits are is OpenZFS, because it actually checksums the data on the way down and on the way back up. And if it doesn't get the same bit back, it flips the table and says, I'm stopping now. Go get your backups. You have backups, right? Um, OK, so with that aside, the last thing on my list is um, Google Glass. Five months ago, I got an invite that says, hey, you can get one of these. And I said, I've wanted a heads-up display since I was seven. Yes. Charged forward, got it, and 
immediately sat there going, this is different. Uh, this image got published by Google at some point. This was the evolution of how they got to uh, the generation before what I have in my hands now. The previous generations were worse. <laughs> Everybody goes, there's an ugly blob of electronics on your head. As compared to what exactly? <laughs> um, so Google Glass, if you haven't played with the interface, this is what it looks like. Hypothetically, these are screenshots from my phone. Ignore the stuff on the right side. Um, that's what it, actually, no, that's what it looks like most of the time. <laughs> Basically the entire time, it's sort of like, and the battery's dead. Okay. And the battery's dead again. Um, Google Glass is, again, roughly a Galaxy Nexus cell phone in a hardware equivalency. This one's hung off of your head. So I have a Galaxy Nexus, I have a Nexus Q, and I have Google Glass. All of them are running the same series of OMAP chips from TI. It's, they're all the same date this sheet. It's amusing in that sense. One of the most useful things for Google Glass is the fact that you have a camera collinear with your head, ready to shoot a photo at nearly any opportunity. What this means is I end up collecting a lot of photos. And in my case, I end up collecting a lot of photos of myself as people are sitting there playing with Google Glass for the first time trying to figure out how to run it. <laughs> this was not an intended result when I started doing this, but I keep on getting these photos. And the collection is growing and growing. The other photo that I get all the time is this one. <laughs> because when you take them off of your head and set them down, you hit the button on the top of it, which shoots the photo of whatever. <laughs> and interface-wise, I really love this. The button on the top of this is an instant jump to photo right now, no lag, no nothing, done, photo shot. Having that instant photo ability is something that I actually miss from carrying around an SLR because the SLRs are pretty much all set for photo shoot priority. You hit the shutter release, the thing fires. What else was I doing at the time? I was busy formatting the tribe. Not anymore. You're shooting a photo. In the same sense, this immediately jumps to shoot photo or shoot video. One button touch. You can also do it uh, via winking at it, yelling at it, or navigating through tapping on the side of the touchpad on the side of it. This is also one of the entertaining parts of Glass. We're, they are still figuring out the interface, and the people in the Explorer program are busy trying to explain how the interface isn't working so well. Um, and thus, usually, uh, if you're familiar with the Perl line, there's more than one way to do it. That applies to Glass, too. There's usually three or four different ways to get the same effect through the interface by different But it's always fun because now you have a camera mounted right next to your head. I went to the gun range with this one day, and it's really neat being able to see video shot directly from the angle that you are uh, running from. It's also really bad to see how bad my marksmanship is. <laughs> um, turns out I was upside of the video. Why is it in a spray all to the right? Look at the video. Because the sights have been knocked out of alignment. Oh, yeah, that would do it. Being able to document what's going on through a camera so that you have that to go back and look at is actually extremely convenient for moving forward and figuring out what went wrong. Bits are useful. Bits are cheap. Extremely handy. Uh, I'm done with slides. I'm more than willing to field questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Anything I've covered, anything you're interested in, um, I will happily sit around and play with the stuff all day and give demos of it. Uh, I'll probably be out in the uh, atrium at some point, but I'm more than willing to field questions right now. Go ahead. Is there any way to sync the Nexus Qs uh, with CyanogenMon on them? I have not. Okay, I have not yet found a way to build the synchronization engine of the Nexus Q into Cyanogen. It is on my list of work to do. I have a nearly infinite list of entertaining problems to go fight. This is one of them. Uh, I would very much like that functionality. This is why the prototype one is interesting to me. I'm curious if I can find the software stack that was already doing that as part of their release source code. 
uh, the statement was made, Google's usually fairly open. I wonder if you ask them for it. I'm reasonably certain it's already there, but Google has gone into denial about the Nexus queue ever existing. <laughs> so I am scraping through GitHub looking for code names of the machine, hunting for various software repositories that were snagged by somebody else at an earlier time. And thus I am snagging bits left and right. See, Git Annex, my great friend and Git, replicating large piles of source code of various forms. Anyone else? So you've got lots of futuristic kit there. Um, and you clearly live in the future, but... Uh, Beta. Broken. <laughs> right. It's all well, broken. Uh, what sort of alpha level future stuff would you like to see? Alpha. You know, like, where, where, uh, what's the future for you, being someone who lives in the future for us? Cell phones are going to be the mechanism which we stage forward on trying to figure out how we integrate this stuff into our lives. Ten years ago, nobody would expect that we were all standing around with um, basically supercomputers of the time in our pockets, sitting idle, because there's nothing to do with them that we could come up with. Uh, always on connectivity altered our universe. Most of this technology relies on the always on connectivity, and that's usually how it's face planted. I think the Google wearable Android stuff with the smartwatches that I saw recently coming out are going to be basically the path by which we figure out how to accommodate the utilization of wearable tech. And that's because glass still is weird, still really expensive, still a wonky interface, and still triggers a lot of social stigma. Watches, on the other hand, oh yeah, it's just a watch. Sure, right. A watch with a pair of A9s, 16 gigs of flash, a gig of RAM, and a battery that lasts for days. Just a watch. We are shoving computers in nearly everything we can because it's so cheap to do so. We are shoving compute platforms that can do arbitrary things everywhere we can because it's so cheap to do so. Now we've got to figure out something useful to do with them. And that's usually the hard question. Why did I want that there? It's going to be there. It's just the cheapest way to make the thing work. But, okay, how can I make that useful for me? And that'll vary quite a bit. Go ahead. But wait for the mic. This is, I guess, a little loaded question because I know what you do for a living. But, um... With all these uh, computers that we're stuffing into everything, what do you see as the uh, next big security concern of this Internet of Things going forward? I heard a quote, I believe it was uh, Dan Kaminsky who said this in a DEF CON talk in 2007. And it was in reference to the DNS um, bug Serviceability is survivability. We have to figure out how do we automate the serviceability of every single computing platform. Because if it's not designed to be fixed, it has to be designed to be thrown away. Because if I can't patch it while it's in production, it, the only upgrade path is the dumpster. And that's not going to work out. Just as importantly, we have to be able to recreate and be able to recreate programmatically our entire compute environment up and down the entire chain. Embedded OSs and embedded code terrifies me because I don't know where it is. The manufacturer is not going to support it. And if it has a bug, my only mechanism to remediate is by throwing it away. Serviceability is survivability. And we don't know how to build serviceability things right now. I'm going to declare us out of time. I'll be around for the rest of the con. I'm more than happy to chat about any of this stuff. Thank you all for putting up with my insanity. <laughs>